Hey, this is Tony from Adafruit, and in this video, I'm going to follow up to the video I did last time on creating a digital fidget spinner. So this is a fidget spinner that uh, uses an accelerometer on Circuit Playground to detect when you tap it from a certain direction, and then it spins around LEDs. And in the previous video, which I'll put a link in the description when this goes up on YouTube uh, so you can watch it, I did this digital fidget spinner with Circuit Playground, the classic board, but it also works with the Express board using Arduino. So this is using the C and C++ based language. Uh, it's really cool, fun little project. But in this video today, I wanna actually try and recreate a spinner, a digital fidget spinner using Circuit Python and the Circuit Playground Express board. And so I'll kind of go through uh, just real quickly what Circuit Playground Express is. So it's this board right here, which this is a purple one because it's a prototype board. Uh, but this is a new board that we have that uses the Atmel SAMD21 microprocessor that can run CircuitPython, or, which is a version of MicroPython. So this is kind of cool. You can run Python code on this board and control all the peripherals on it, like the NeoPixels, uh, the accelerometer, all of those different features of it. So we'll see if we can recreate this fidget spinner. This is the Arduino version right here in uh, CircuitPython and make a version where, you know, when I tap it from a certain direction, it'll start spinning in that direction. And we'll kind of see some challenges that I run into um, with this, uh, particularly with memory usage. So that's kind of the, the big thing that you see as I show a lot of examples of doing something in Arduino versus doing it in MicroPython or CircuitPython, uh, the memory usage becomes more of an issue to deal with. So we'll see some problems that I run into and maybe some ways that you might be able to deal with that um, or kind of work around um, some of the issues for it. Now, of course, I have my uh, trusty cat helper here. This is what, what happens when uh, when you get up off of your chair and your cat uh, takes over for a second there. So I, you just have to learn to live with it. That's her chair now. So, uh, okay, so we'll dive in. And like I said, I'm gonna start with um, just talking about what is Circuit Playground Express. I'll show really quickly how to load Circuit Python onto the Circuit Playground Express board. Um, and then I'll show an example of how to start reading data from the accelerometer. And then we'll build a quick little fidget spinner and look at an example uh, that I've already created ahead of time for this. So let's get started. Let's jump to the main view. And let's see, yeah, we'll swap there. And let's take a quick look at, um, this is basically a link to the Circuit Playground Express board product page. So I'll put a link in this uh, in the des uh, description down below when this goes up on YouTube. So you can click that link and check out the board. Uh, but basically it is an all-in-one electronics learning board uh, like the Microbit or the Circuit Play Playground Classic board uh, that we've had for about a year now. And basically there are 10 NeoPixels in a circle on this board. Um, there's an accelerometer in the middle, there's a light sensor, there's a temperature sensor, there's a microphone, there's a speaker, uh, there's even an infrared receiver and uh, LED, so you can like receive remote control codes and things, we'll look at that in the future. Uh, but a lot of cool things built into this board, and then it's using, like I mentioned, that Atmel SAMD21 microprocessor that has a version of MicroPython called CircuitPython that you can run on this board. So you can run Python code directly on this board uh, and do all kinds of fun stuff like control the hardware on this board. And so like I was showing before, I did this fidget spinner project in Arduino. So we're gonna see if I can do this in MicroPython and CircuitPython uh, to create this same kind of effect where you know using that accelerometer on the board, detect when you tap it and then move uh, the pixels around, animate them going in a circle. Uh, so you'll definitely, you, you'll have to have this Circuit Playground Express board. Unfortunately, you cannot run CircuitPython or MicroPython on the Circuit Playground Classic board. So the Classic board is the older one. Uh, it has the Atmel ATmega32U4 processor, which is uh, too low in memory and processing power to support MicroPython. So the SAMD21 uh, is kind of the bare minimum, although there's actually some boards that have even less memory and CPU, like the Microbit, uh, but still managed to make it work. Uh, but I'd say the you know, SAMD21 is kind of the bare minimum, something with like around 32 kilobytes of memory is what you need uh, to really make use of MicroPython. Uh, so you'll need this board, and uh, the first thing that is interesting though, when you have this board, um, it doesn't ship right now with MicroPython or CircuitPython loaded on it. It's set up, you can use the MakeCode environment, so MakeCode.com, I've actually done some videos on that um, previously. So you can program this from the web using a graphical um, environment, and up in the upper right hand corner I have uh, just an example, this is the Circuit Playground Express board. Again, this is purple because it's a prototype board. Uh, but this is running the, the fidget spinner code. So, you know, if, if I tap that, you can see this is what we'll build in this video. Uh, so it's a pretty faithful reproduction of the Arduino version, it looks like. 
Uh, anyways, though, so this is the Circuit Player on Express board, but it doesn't run Circuit Python by default. So I'll show you real quickly how to load Circuit Python onto this board. And it's actually really easy. Uh, what you need to do is go to the Circuit Python repository, and I'll put a link in the description when this goes up on YouTube, and go to the releases page, and then find the latest release. Uh, I'm using the 0.10.1 uh, .10 release, and look for the Adafruit Circuit Python Circuit Playground Express. Uh, version number .uf2 file. So it's this file that you want right here. There's also a .bin file, um, but the .bin file, that uses a separate tool. There's a special tool called Bossa C that you can use to upload the bin file. It's what Arduino uses internally. Uh, but this uf2 is using this cool mode that I've talked about before, where on the Circuit Playground Express board, uh, I basically I've connected it to my computer. If you're using Windows, you do have to install a driver. Uh, the Circuit Playground Express guy kind of mentions this stuff. Uh, but once you have that driver installed on Mac and on Linux, you don't need a driver installed. But if you double press the reset button, the reset button's right in the middle of it, so you kind of double click it, you'll see all the lights turn green. Um, and then the red LED, this uh, D13 LED starts pulsing. And that means it's in the special bootloader mode. Uh, so if you download this .uf2 file ahead of time, and then uh, you go to your file explorer, you'll actually see there's a drive here called cplay boot. And it has this current .uf2 file inside of it. And so that's the actual firmware of this board that's, uh, that's loaded on it. So if you're using like the make code system, uh, or even the Arduino IDE, that would have your Arduino or your make code uh, firmware on there. But for CircuitPython, you basically just want to take this .uf2 file that you downloaded and drag it onto your board. Now on Mac OS X, El Capitan, sometimes I've seen a bug where it won't copy over, so we'll see if this works. Uh, but we'll see. Okay, so if you get this error that there's not enough free space, uh, the workaround here is to rename this to current.uf2 and then copy it over. So I'm glad I can kind of demonstrate this. Again, this only seems to happen on Mac OS X, uh, El Capitan, on other file systems. Uh, for some reason, it doesn't uh, matter. So who knows? Hopefully, at some point, we'll figure out what the issue is here. I'm just telling you to replace that firmware. So you can see it just uploaded the firmware and it reprogrammed the board. So now it's running MicroPython or CircuitPython firmware. Uh, and I can actually confirm that. So if I open up my terminal here, uh, I can now connect to my board using the serial um, uh, connection. So the board, it, it will show up. You can see there's actually a circuit uh, Pi uh, USB drive. And so this is showing all of the files that are on my board's file system. And the, the Circuit Playground Express board has a little two megabyte uh, flash chip, which stores all of your files, like your Python code. Um, the nice thing is when you load the CircuitPython firmware, it doesn't delete all of those files that are on your file system. So these are actually files that I had on the file system already. It keeps those uh, on the file system, and then you just get a new CircuitPython firmware um, loaded onto it. But I'm gonna connect using the screen uh, serial terminal to the uh, serial port that the board also shows up as. So it shows up as a USB drive and as a serial port at 11.5200 baud. Again, this is just gonna access the REPL of the uh, the MicroPython board or the CircuitPython board. You can see it's I've got the REPL running. I can press a key and hey, we've got CircuitPython all loaded and ready to go here. So that's good. So, you know, this is basically the bare minimum to get CircuitPython loaded on the Circuit Playground Express board. Just double tap the reset button copy over the .uf2 file that you've downloaded from the CircuitPython releases tab, uh, and then you're good to go at that point. And if you get an error that there's you're out of space on Mac OS X, rename it to current.uf2. Uh, okay, so that's all good. Um, let's see, I'm gonna close out of the serial terminal. So let's dig into the real meat of this where I want to try and rebuild this fidget spinner project um, using CircuitPython now instead of using Arduino. So. With the Arduino version of this, and I did a whole video on how this thing works, uh, what I do is I read the accelerometer values for one of the axes. It, it, on the Circuit Playground Classic board, the Y axis is the axis that goes kind of this way and that way. So that when I tap that Y axis, I put a really strong impulse. Uh, you know, I move the board really quickly in that direction. And if I read the accelerometer on that Y axis very, very quickly, I can detect when it spikes up to a really high level. And I showed in the last video how I apply some kind of interesting smoothing and processing uh, to, uh, to detect you know, when there's a sharp peak, but not like a slow movement. Because you know, 
me just moving the board back and forth like this is actually changing that accelerometer value, but it's not fast enough. It's not a sharp enough impulse versus when I tap the board like that. Uh, you know, that, that's the real trick of it is detecting that sharp impulse and rejecting all of the other kind of slower, just normal movement um, for that. And so I showed with the Arduino version, if I sample the accelerometer really quickly and apply this peak detection uh, logic to it, then I can pretty easily detect, you know, when someone kind of taps the board and even from which direction, because, you know, when I tap it from this, this direction, that's an impulse one way. But if I tap it from this direction, you can see it starts spinning in the opposite direction because that's an impulse the opposite way on that axis. And so that's the cool thing about uh, the accelerometer is that you know the axes, you get a positive and a negative value. So just based on the sign, whether it's positive or negative, that that force is coming from, I can detect how you've tapped the board and then spin the pixel appropriately. And then the pixels, they slow down. All that is just some animation logic that I talked about in the last video. So, you know, it's really just the magic of the accelerometer here that, that's doing all of this logic of detecting when I tap the board. Um, so I knew kind of going into this, though, that with CircuitPython and MicroPython in general, what I did with Arduino is going to be a lot more difficult because this sketch only really works if I can sample the accelerometer very quickly, like over 100 times a second. Because when I tap the accelerometer, you get a really large spike, but it happens really quickly and just for a very small fraction of time. I mean, you know, my, my finger is only touching this board for like, uh, I don't know, a tenth of a second at most. So if I can only sample the accelerometer, like let's say 10 times a second, if I didn't happen to sample it right when my finger touched it, I'm going to miss that impulse and I'm not going to see the acceleration. Uh, which would be unfortunate, you know, you'd just be tapping away, nothing's happening on the board um, for it. And so the big difference between using MicroPython and Arduino is that MicroPython or CircuitPython, they're in an, an interpreted language. So your CircuitPython code is not running directly on the processor, it's basically in memory. And then there's some code that's running, the actual MicroPython or CircuitPython firmware, that's converting all of those Python instructions into CPU instructions. And so that takes some time to do that. Uh, and it basically means if I have a loop that's reading the accelerometer, it's going to be a lot faster in Arduino because that's just compiling straight down to code that runs on the CPU versus in MicroPython or CircuitPython, it's going to run an order of magnitude slower uh, just because of the nature of being in an interpreted language. So I kind of knew going into this, okay, if I try to sample this accelerometer, you know, let's say 100 times a second, um, you know, that probably won't be possible. Uh, I haven't actually tested it to see how fast I can uh, sample the accelerometer, but I wanted to think about and see, you know, is there a different approach I could take for this? You know, instead of trying to just read that accelerometer really, really fast, um, could I change the behavior of this slightly so that the, the fidget spinner doesn't rely on that and maybe relies on something else? And it turns out I can. So the accelerometer that's used on this board, it's this uh, accelerometer called the LIS-3DH uh, from ST uh, Electronics. And it's a nice little uh, accelerometer. And if you check out the data sheet for it, you can actually see it has a whole bunch of modes for it. And again, I'll put links to this description uh, or this page when it goes up on uh, YouTube down in the description below. Uh, but anyways, you know, in general, it's always handy to check the data sheets for all of the hardware that you're working with just to see what's available. Uh, even if it's something that you're using from Adafruit, uh, if you're using like one of our libraries, for example, you know, sometimes there are more advanced features that maybe the libraries don't expose yet uh, that might give you some ideas. And so this chip has a neat little mode uh, that we call click detection or tap detection, where basically you can tell this chip to look for a strong impulse on one of its three axes, or maybe all three of its axes, because it has an XYZ axis of motion. And that's kind of similar to what I'm doing here in my Arduino sketch. Like basically this chip has built into it some logic to detect when there's a strong tap and even a strong double tap impulse um, on, on the accelerometer. And so it's kind of cool. Now the, it took a little bit of digging to figure out where this is because um, if you just read the data sheet, it mentions all the registers for this thing. So this is the data sheet for the board, but it doesn't really tell you much about how that click detection works. Um, so just as a note, if you're kind of new to working with electronics and things, uh, when you're looking at a chip, also look at the application notes. Uh, so if you, this is the, the kind of the homepage for the chip. It mentions this application note, this LIS-3DH uh, application note. 
And this is actually twice as big as the data sheet. This is two megabytes versus a megabyte. There's a lot more information in the application note. And if you check this out, this is a great document uh, to also look at for the LIS3DH because it actually goes into what are all the cool features of this chip. And here's a whole section on the click and double click recognition. And it even goes into how this works. It's really cool. Uh, basically what it does is you give it a window of time and a threshold value. Uh, and if an acceleration value on any of the axes goes above that threshold value and then back down within that window of time. So you can see like here's this window of time and here's the acceleration value. It goes up above the threshold and then it shoots back down the threshold within that window of time. So it's a very quick impulse basically. Uh, then it can detect that and it can fire an interrupt. It can alert your code in some way to say, hey, I saw a tap or a click. Uh, and if that impulse lasts a little too long, you know, maybe it was like a sharp movement, but a you know, sharp continuous movement, you know, maybe you threw the board or something like that, uh, then in that case it won't fire. So you can see like when that window of time is uh, you know, maybe really short and you get an impulse, but that impulse continues on for a long time. Uh, it waits for that window of time, and it, if it hasn't fallen back down below the threshold, then it doesn't fire that. So it's a little bit different algorithm. You know, in, in my Arduino version, um, I was looking at the, the peak impulses by kind of smoothing out and comparing the standard deviations and things. So, you know, maybe the peak detection I did with Arduino is, I don't know, better in some ways, but it's, it's hard to really say, you know, what's better or worse. Like, they both work. Um, but the cool thing is this is built into the chip itself. I just need to set a few registers and the chip will do this for me and it will do it really fast. Like I don't need my microprocessor to be constantly pulling the chip to say like, what is your acceleration? Uh, you know, smooth all these values out, make this thing work. I just let the accelerometer do that. And then the accelerometer will tell me when it detects a click or a strong impulse on an axis. Uh, now it's even more advanced. It has a double click mode where uh, given a longer window of time, if it sees two impulses within that window of time, then it can actually fire a double click event. Um, so, you know, really cool features, but I don't really need that for my fidget spinner, but that might be a fun, another variation of the fidget spinner to look at, you know, the double click fidget spinner where you have to double tap it to, uh, to get it started. Um, but so that made me think, okay, so what if I redo this fidget spinner instead of trying to implement the impulse detection myself, Let's use the click detection built into the accelerometer. And then that way, I think I have a much stronger chance from my CircuitPython code. Uh, you know, it doesn't need to run very fast. Like it just needs to tell the accelerometer, turn on the click detection. Uh, and then when you detect a click, start spinning the spinner around. Um, and so let's, well, maybe we'll, we'll do that implementation first and we'll look at some of the limitations of that because the one cool thing, you know, with the Arduino version is I can, I can detect the direction of the click, like this way versus that way. Uh, and I can also detect the magnitude of it, like if it's a strong click, um, you know, or a more softer click, then I spin more slowly. So we'll kind of see, like just based on the click detection, you don't necessarily get both those features of the direction and the magnitude of the click, but we'll see there are some more features built into this little accelerometer that might help us get some of that data. Um, and so we'll see how we can kind of, we'll, we'll just evolve this uh, sketch to make it more advanced and more interesting. Okay, so to start with this, um, what you'll wanna do is use the accelerometer that's built into the Circuit Playground Express board and that's the LIS3DH accelerometer. I've done a whole guide and video on how to use this with CircuitPython. Um, and this was not in the context of the Circuit Playground Express board, but hey, surprise, surprise, we kind of knew that this was coming. So uh, it was handy to do a guide for that ahead of time. Anyways, uh, take a look at this guide. I'll put a link to this in the description when this goes up on YouTube. This will give you some background on this accelerometer. And more importantly, it tells you how to install the module that you need to make this thing work. Uh, and so follow this guide. Basically, there's some code that you need to install uh, to copy to this board. So what you need to do uh, is you need to go to this Adafruit CircuitPython LAS3DH uh, repository and in the releases tab, uh, grab the zip file for the latest release, download that zip file. When you open it up, there'll be a directory inside of there and you're gonna copy that directory onto your CircuitPython board. Uh, but you're not done yet because you also need to get the CircuitPython bus device uh, module and the guide mentions this also. Uh, and again, go to the release tab, grab the zip file for the latest release, 
download it, unzip it, you'll see a directory, copy that entire directory onto your CircuitPython board. Uh, and then there's one other thing that you probably want to copy because we're going to use the NeoPixels on this board. So there's a NeoPixel module that you'll also need to install. Uh, go to this GitHub repository, which I'll put a link in the description when this goes up on YouTube. Uh, and on this one in the releases tab, there's just a neopixel.mpy file. So download this file and just copy it onto your MicroPython board. So again, because with the SAMD21, it shows up as a drive uh, on your computer. You know, here's my, my uh, CircuitPython drive. And you can see I've copied over that Adafruit LIS3DH folder. If you go inside here, there's just these .mpy and .py files and things. Uh, I've also copied over that bus device folder, like I mentioned, uh, and then the neopixel.mpy file on here. Uh, and you can ignore these other files on here. Uh, they're not kind of used right now. Uh, okay, so that's what I've started with. And then let's go back to the LIS3DH GitHub repository. Inside of here, there's an examples folder. And so this has a few examples uh, that you can look at. And if you just want to skip everything and go straight to the goodness of the fidget spinner, grab the spinner.py example. This is going to be the finished uh, fidget spinner. But we'll kind of see how I got to that uh, in, a, in a few steps here. So uh, let's start with this click.py. This is some click detection uh, examples that, that we can make work with. Um, this board. And so this uses that click detection that's built into the accelerometer. I'm actually going to open up that code already. So I've got this click.py. This is just the example file from that LIS3DH um, repository. And let's make this work with Circuit Playground Express. So there is a little bit of a change that you need to make when you're using the LIS3DH with the Circuit Playground Express board. Um, so you can see in the guide I talk about, there are actually multiple ways you can wire up this accelerometer to your board. Um, you can use a spy interface or an I squared C interface, and you can use like a software spy or a software I squared C interface, all kinds of options. When you're using Circuit Playground Express, it's a little more simple in that you're always going to use the hardware I squared C interface uh, because that's how the board is wired, uh, how, that's how the chip is wired to the board. And unless you desolder it and completely rebuild the board, you're not going to change that. Uh, so you'll want to use this option at the top. But it, the accelerometer is not connected to the default I squared C bus. So on the outside of Circuit Playground Express, there's actually an SCL and an SDA pin uh, over here. And that's where you can connect up your own I squared C peripherals. But the accelerometer is actually on a separate internal I squared C bus. And it's actually uh, under a couple different pins that we've just named appropriately the accelerometer uh, underscore SCL and accelerometer underscore SCA uh, right here. Accelerometer, there we go. So basically, I've just changed in this I squared C uh, line right here where I'm calling in the bus IO module. I create an instance of the I squared C bus. And normally, you pass it the pin that's your clock line and then your data line. Um, and in this case, I'm going to change it to the accelerometer SCL and accelerometer SDA pins. And so that's going to tell. Uh, this code to create an instance of the I squared C bus on that internal accelerometer I squared C bus. Uh, and then the next line here is where I create an instance of the LIS3DH uh, accelerometer class. There's also one little change you have to make right here. The default I squared C address of the device is normally, I think it's uh, hex value 18. But on this board, um, we've actually set one of the wires so that it changes the address. So you want to set the address equal to 25. You basically override it and say, OK, uh, the address value is a little bit different for this board. A lot of different I squared C chips give you the ability to change the address. So this is the configuration that you want for using the LIS3DH chip on the Circuit Playground Express board. And in the future, we're going to have a, a wrapper library for Circuit Playground Express that will do some of this stuff for you automatically. Um, but if you're playing with it yourself and building something that, that uses the LIS3DH library, make sure to change your code to look like this. Uh, I'm going to delete all this commented stuff because it doesn't matter. Uh, and then let's just look real fast at the um, what this example does. So it sets the range of the accelerometer. And so this accelerometer has uh, four different ranges. It can have uh, a plus or minus two Gs or two gravity range, uh, plus or minus four G, plus or minus eight G, and plus or minus 16 Gs of range. Uh, now you can increase the range, but the precision of the accelerometer is still fixed. You only get, I think it's like 12 bits of data. So you can have a really wide range, like up to plus or minus 16 Gs of acceleration. 
um, but you're not going to be able to tell you know really small differences of acceleration within that range whereas if you go down to a plus or minus 2g range of acceleration you've got all full 12 bits within that range so you know you can detect smaller differences there and it's a trade-off uh, you know you can't get everything for free uh, on these on these chips unfortunately so in this example we'll just keep it at this default value of 2g's uh, and then you can see I call this set click function, which turns on the click detection. And you tell it if you want a uh, single click or double click. In this case, the value 2 says I want to detect double clicks, uh, but we'll also detect single clicks. And then this threshold is just a number that kind of tunes the sensitivity of the click detection. And it depends on the range it mentions here. You want to change this based on the range. We'll just leave the default value in here uh, to, to keep it as is. And then the rest of this is just a loop where it's just going to run and it's going to call this read click function and it'll just print out this returns two boolean values and so if single is true then it detected a single click if double is true then it also detected a double click um, in that moment in time and then it just delays and it just keeps calling that read click function over and over to see if a, a click has been detected so let's save this and let's run this on our board uh, so i'm in that directory i've got my click.py in here i'm going to use the ampi tool which i've talked about and used a lot uh, before to run this example on my board uh, and so before I do that I'm going to export ampi underscore port equals the serial port of my board this is just so that I don't need to specify the port parameter to ampi every time I call it it's going to read it from the environment here uh, I did a whole guide on using ampi so I'll put a link in the description when this, go when this goes up on YouTube uh, so you can see how to use this tool uh, okay so I'm going to use the ampi run uh, I'm going to use the dash n command this is going to tell to run a script but not wait for any output. Just run it, let it run, and then I can connect to the serial terminal and see all the output. Because basically, I want to see when I get these single click and double click events uh, from my board. So I'm going to need to open the serial terminal after it runs. But let's run that click.py. And now let's connect to the serial terminal for my board again. And hopefully it's running. It looks like it's probably running. And so now if I tap the board, hey, that's cool. It just printed out single click. So that means that this read click function was called and it saw that single click when I tap the board. Uh, let's go back and let's see what happens if I double tap the board. So if I go like that, there we go. So you can see it's a, it sometimes it detects it, sometimes it doesn't. You have to be kind of quick about it. Uh, and this also doesn't help in that as I'm tapping the board, it's kind of bouncing off the table a little bit. So it's getting like multiple clicks and things from that. But you can see like it, it's it's noticing, you know, there's an initial click. And then if a second click comes fast enough, it detects it as a double click event there. Um, so, you know, maybe I don't really care about the double click events in this case for my fidget spinner. Um, so let's just change this code a little bit. So I'm going to tell it let's only detect a single click uh, in this case. So I don't even need this double click uh, kind of statement here. And then, uh, and so I just did that by changing, you know, this parameter from a two to a one. And then let's also change the, the uh, range of acceleration. So let's increase the range to 16 G. And then because I've increased the range, you know, notice down here, it says I, I should probably change the threshold. And so I want to decrease this threshold value. Um, so let's start with a value like 10 and see what this does. So I'm going to save this. And then I'm going to exit out of that terminal and I'm going to rerun my script. So I'm going to use that run command again with the dash n option, uh, rerun the script, and then let's open the serial terminal. And okay, so now I see, and okay, so that's cool. But if I double click this thing, so I'm double tapping it a lot and I don't see any double tap events. So it's only detecting single clicks, uh, which is cool. Uh, but this is interesting though, in that, you know, this is detecting from any axis. So I'm clicking it straight down. That's hitting, that's the Z axis on the board, the kind of up down axis. But I want this left right axis here, kind of this axis. And that'll work. Like if I tap it, it's actually detecting single clicks um, in that case. But I want to be able to restrict it to just that axis. You know, I, I don't want it so that if I tap the front of the board, you know, I, I don't want it to spin. I want it only when I tap the side of the board like that. So that's one kind of thing to know is that by default, this set click function is going to detect clicks from all of the axes, from the x, y, and z axis. So if it sees any sharp impulse from any of those axes, it will detect that as a single click. Um, so if you go to the data sheet for this accelerometer, uh, you can actually see that the click detection, or actually the app note, uh, it can be restricted to certain axes. So everything is controlled through this click config register, and you actually have to tell it which axes you want to turn the click detection on for. 
So you can tell it you want the z-axis, the y-axis, uh, or the x-axis uh, to be enabled. And actually, if you look into the library code for this set click function, it turns on the click detection for all three of those axes by sending a certain value to that click config register. Uh, but actually, I updated the library recently because I realized, hey, maybe you want to restrict it to only look at a certain axis. Like on this board, you know, the way it's configured, the x-axis is the one that's going in this direction that my uh, my finger is pointing. So I want to change this click config register so that this xs value right here basically enable the interrupt single tap on the x-axis. I want this click config register to have this set to one and everything else set to zero because that's the other axes. And it's actually, there's, a, there's another bit that does the double tap, but I don't care about that. Uh, and then there's the single taps for the other axes. So, okay, so I need to get in there and kind of custom change that register value. Uh, so I, I just added a way to do that in the set click function. Basically, you can override the click config register and give it a value that you want, uh, that, you know, just an explicit 8-bit value. Uh, and I can actually specify this in binary if I want. This is the nice thing about Python. The 0B syntax means that I can give a binary literal value. So like 0, 0, 0, 0, that's you know, four zeros. And then 0, 0, 0, 1. So basically this is an 8-bit value that ends in 1. Uh, it's you know, basically the value 1. Uh, but if I map that to all of the bits in this click config register, that means the XS bit would be turned on, and that's what I want. That's going to turn on the single tap on the X axis uh, for the click detection. So let's do that. Uh, I'm also going to bump the threshold up a bit because uh, basically this is something to play with. So tune this threshold value. I, I noticed if value is kind of below 20, where sometimes, you know, like too light of a click uh, was being de uh, detected. Uh, so I just increased this value. Basically, the, the higher you make this value, the stronger you need to tap the, the or click the board for the t uh, detection to work. And if you read the app note, you can actually see what this threshold means. It's a, um, it's a fraction of the range of the acceleration. So it's that uh, 16G range divided by 128 times this threshold value is is kind of your your threshold in gravity so you could actually go and compute that out if you wanted but it's the kind of thing where you can just play with it you know set the value see how it behaves increase it decrease it kind of tune it as you go uh, but the important thing again is i'm going to override that click config register by specifying it as the optional parameter here so if i do that and if i save this and then let's uh, exit out of here and let's rerun this script and then uh, let's connect back to our board Okay, so now it should only be detecting clicks on the x-axis, which is kind of this axis here. So if I tap the board uh, straight down, like I'm just going to tap it right on the top, that's the z-axis that's going up and down. So it should not detect a, a tap. Now there's going to be some vibrations in the board. I mean, maybe it will, but let's see. If I kind of tap the board, yeah, I don't, I don't see any clicks happening there. So that's good. That's showing me that you know it's not detecting that tap in that direction. Uh, the y-axis is going this way. So if I tap the board this way, I don't see anything happening there, but here's the x-axis. Let's see what happens if I tap the board that way. So if I go that way, uh, there we go. We've got a single click that way. Uh, maybe if I hold the board this way, it might be a little easier. So if I tap the board, single click, single click. That's good. If I tap the board up and down, nothing, nothing. Single click that way. So cool. So that's that means that I've been able to restrict the click detection to only detect an impulse on you know this axis of the board, like the left or the right side of the board. Um, so that's pretty cool. I mean, that's good enough, I think, to do a quick little basic version of the fidget spinner. Um, the one thing you'll notice is it doesn't know the direction uh, that you're tapping this board. You know, if I tap it from this side, that's a single click. If I tap it from this side, that's a single click also. Um, so, you know, that's that's one challenge, but we'll see that there's a way that I can actually detect that uh, because if, if you're a smart reader or if you've gone to the data sheet and you've looked at it already, there is another register that's more interesting, uh, the click source register right here. And this actually tells you when a click event happens, uh, you get more than just the fact that it's a single or double click. That's actually this D click and S click bits. If these are set, then it saw a single or double click. There's also this sign bit, and that's really cool because that tells you if it was a positive or a negative click, like which direction the click came from. So if I look at the click register and the sign bit, then I'll know which side did you tap it from. 
Uh, and then I can know, like start animating one way or start animating the other way potentially. Um, now, the one thing is you don't get the magnitude or like how large was that click? You know, was it a really strong click or was it a really light click? And so we'll come back to see how I also figured that out. Uh, there's another thing that we can use to, to look at that. But let's just real quickly make a fidget spinner just using just the single click. Uh, we'll just have it spin in one direction right now uh, to, to start with. So if you go back uh, to the previous video I did on the Arduino project, uh, basically I have an Arduino version of this. It's in the Circuit Playground classic library. Uh, and it's basically the, the fidget spinner um, example inside of there. And inside of there, um, basically I made this fidget spinner class, which represents the fidget spinner as an object. And I just gave it two functions. Um, I can get the current position of the fidget spinner, and that's gonna be a value that goes from zero to 10, or actually just below 10, uh, it's, it's 10 exclusive. Uh, and it's a, it's a continuous value, it's a floating point value. And so that just kind of represents what is the position of my fidget spinner around my board, because there are 10 pixels on this board. So if this value goes from zero to 10, it's just always gonna be spinning around that zero to 10 value. Um, and then there's a spin function I can call to kind of flick it with an initial velocity. So start it off with an, an initial velocity, I apply an exponential decay to that velocity, so that's why it slows down. And in the last video, I talked a little bit about that. Um, but you just keep, basically you kick it with the spin function, you give it an initial velocity, that'll start it spinning at that velocity. And then you call this get position function over and over, and you tell it how much time has elapsed since the last time you called it. And it's gonna tell you, okay, your spinner has moved now to you know position two. And then you call it a few milliseconds later and it's like, okay, you're at position two and a half. And maybe a few more milliseconds later, okay, now you're at position three. And so you're, you know, you're slowly moving around the board. And it, it takes care of all that logic of, uh, you know, t figuring out what is the speed of the, of the spinner and what is the position. And then once I have that, I can just turn on the pixel at the appropriate position for that. So let's recreate this class in Python uh, effectively. And so this is the nice thing is that you'll see kind of like, here's the class in C and C++ and you got all these brackets and scary syntax and things going on and public and private and it's all these C++-isms. Uh, this is the nice thing about Python. It's maybe a little bit simpler to implement classes and things like that. So. Let's add uh, an example here. Let's make this class. So uh, let's create a class. We'll call this uh, the fidget spinner. And then uh, in all the classes in Python, you usually need to have an initializer function, which is this like your constructor. This is what's called when you initialize the object. Uh, and every, every object or every function inside of a class takes as the first parameter the self object. And so that, that's how you refer to the object uh, that, that, the, uh, that the function is operating on, the instance of the object, rather. Uh, this is where you initialize all your variables, but I usually, just as a form of habit, I just I know I'm going to fill this in later as I think about what this class needs to implement. Uh, the nice thing in Python, you can just say, hey, implement this function, but just do nothing and pass. Uh, so, you know, I'll come back to this later. Oops. And then, of course, the Atom text editor tries to outsmart me and, and tries to, uh, to fill in some other extra things. Anyways, let's put those two functions in that I had. So I had a spin function, and that's gonna take an initial velocity, and let's just do nothing for now. And then there's the get position function, and that's gonna take a, an elapsed number of seconds, like how many seconds elapsed since the last time I called this function. Uh, and so let's just pass on that also. Um, okay, so let's start filling in this function, and actually I can just grab the code that I had from Arduino here. So when the spin function starts off, I basically need to remember what is that initial velocity that I was uh, that I was told in this spin function, and then I need to reset the uh, amount of elapsed time to zero because um, you know based on how much time has elapsed since I started it spinning, it's going to apply that exponential decay to the initial velocity, and that, that's why it slows down over time as it spins. Um, so okay, so in my spin function, then basically I just need to keep track of that velocity that I was told. That's my initial velocity. And then I'm gonna to need to have the elapsed time and we'll reset that to zero. Uh, and you know, now since I, I'm noticing I'm using these as kind of internal variables, um, let's initialize those to just starting values. Um, so let's start with no velocity because I probably don't want my spinner just right out of the gate to be spinning. Although you could, you could say that, hey, it's a very happy spinner that's ready to go. Uh, or let's see, uh, let's, let's start with an elapsed value of zero, so no time has elapsed. Um, okay, so that's our spin function. Now the position function here, if we go back to the Arduino version, basically what it does is it just uh, increments the amount of elapsed time, 
and then it computes what's the current velocity by applying some exponential decay to the initial velocity using the elapsed time. Uh, and then it just increments the current position based on the current velocity and how much time has elapsed. Um, and then it just does some magic to make sure that the position always stays within the range of zero to 10. Uh, so that you know you never go to like 11, which would be you know a value. There's there, there aren't 11 pixels on this board, so you know I need to keep it within that range. Uh, so you can do some things. I'll explain as I as I type this in. You can use the modulus operator to constrain it within that zero to 10 range. But then you got to be careful because what if someone gives you a a negative velocity, so you're spinning in the opposite direction. Uh, but I don't have a concept of you know the uh, pixel at position negative five, for example. Uh, I want to wrap that around to position five. And so I, I do that by applying some offsets here if it's negative. Um, okay, so let's look at this function then. So basically I want to increase my elapsed time by uh, the delta time. So this is basically when you call get position, you need to tell it how many seconds elapsed since the last time you called get position. And so in your main loop, you're gonna keep track of how much time has elapsed and you'll tell it that. Um, so I need to keep track of that then I need to compute the current velocity, uh, and that's based on using the math function. So I'm gonna to need to import uh, up above here, let's add the math library, uh, the math.pow function, the power function. So basically if you take some decay rate, and so let's add this as a config, so we'll say decay equals 0 0.5. So if I take that decay rate and I raise it to the power of uh, elapsed time, then that's actually going to give me a value that I can use that's gonna decrease over time. So as elapsed time increases, if this decay value, which should be a value that's between zero and one. So if this value is one, it just means that it's never gonna decay. Uh, but if it's a value of like 0 0.5, it just means, you know, as time elapses, this, this value is gonna keep halving itself uh, at a certain frequency. And so that's how you get this exponential decay. Uh, so what I ultimately then wanna do is multiply my initial velocity, my starting velocity, by that decay rate, that exponential decay rate. So uh, again, like I talked about in the last video, and you can look up on Wikipedia, exponential decay, you know, this is just a graph over time. It, it's, it falls down to a zero value, but it's not a linear, it's not a straight line fall down. It's a very, it's kind of a fast, you know, you have an initial fast velocity and then very quickly it drops down and then slowly kind of tapers off. Uh, and so that's what's happening here with this function. So I'm going to compute my current velocity. Then I need to update my position. So let's say self.position uh, plus equals my current velocity times the amount of time that's elapsed. Uh, so basically this position variable is going to keep track of what is the current position of my fidget spinner. You know, if it goes from zero to 10, just all the way around the board. Uh, and then I'm going to update this position based on just the typical equation for how you uh, compute position based on velocity and amount of elapsed time. So, you know, your new position is your old position plus your velocity times how much time has elapsed. Um, and so that's exactly what's happening here. But this also tells me since I've got this position variable, I should probably initialize this to, let's say zero. So we'll start the spinner off at position zero. Um, okay, so there's that. And then the last little bit is, you know, what happens when I'm at position like nine and I spin past 10 to like, you know, position 11, for example. Uh, I want this spinner to constrain itself to be a value that goes from zero to 10 and then back down to zero again. So it's gonna loop back around. So it's only ever gonna be a value from zero to 10. You know, even if you kick it with a really fast, like 100 pixel per second velocity, it's just gonna wrap around and figure out where it needs to be. So that'll simplify my animation so that I know the position I get from the fidget spinner will always be some value I can map to one of the 10 pixels on the board here. And it turns out you can use the modulus operator to do that uh, kind of logic. And there's a special floating point version because this is a, I, I want the fidget spinner position to be a continuous value. So, you know, it could be one or 1 1.5 or 1.75 or 1.751 or something like that. You know, it doesn't have to be just one or two uh, because the nice thing is, you know, the spinner might be at a halfway value and maybe I want my animation to represent that in some way so that it lights up two pixels. You know, one of the pixels is half as bright or something like that. And I don't do this in this example yet, but maybe in a future version of this um, spinner, 
I could do that. And so that's the logic that I'm going to apply here then. So let's just say my position now equals the math.fmod. So this is a floating point modulus operator, uh, which basically just gives you, so you give it two values. You give it your uh, initial value, like the value that you want. And then what it's going to do is it's going to figure out what is the remainder of this value divided by another value. So I'll show you what I'm going to do. If I take my position value, and then if the second parameter to fmod, I'm going to give uh, the value 10.0. What this means is it's going to set position to uh, position divided by 10, but the remainder of that. So it's you know it's it's going to give me a value. Um, you know, that basically can never be higher or it can never actually be equal to 10. Because if you think about the remainder, you know, the remainder is how much is left over after dividing by some value. So position divided by 10, um, I'm never going to have a remainder of 11 because that just means that, you know, oh, I would have my, my, the actual value I got from the division would have just been one higher. You know, the, the remainder would actually be one in that case. Um, so this is kind of a good trick to make sure that you have a value that stays within a range. Um, and I could use, so there's also a, an integer modulus operator. There's, um, you know, I could say self dot, oops, self dot position, and then the percent sign 10. Uh, and that's actually going to do integer modulo, uh, modulus, uh, I believe, although I think it might actually be floating point in, in Python 3.0. Um, but I want to be explicit because, you know, again, like I said, I, I don't want my position to be constrained to just the integer one, two, three, four values. I want it to be like two and a half because, you know, this little delta of time might be like a millisecond and my, my spinner might be moving so slowly that it just barely moves, you know, a tenth of a pixel in that millisecond. So I want my position to remember that, you know, if, if I didn't, if I just used integer values, it would only know that you know, I've effectively moved zero. You know, I didn't move enough to move one full pixel. I've moved zero. So it would just never move once it gets to a slow value. Uh, so that's why I'm careful to use a floating point or a continuous value here. So that's why I'm using the fmod uh, operator here. Now, the last thing I want to do, though, is that, like I said, velocity might be negative. So I'm, my position might actually go back to a negative value. And I just want to make sure if, if for some reason my position gets negative, I want to wrap it back to a positive value. Um, and so, you know, if I get like negative one, I want that to actually mean the value nine. Like, you know, that negative one actually means the last pixel. You know, if you think of it on the board, like let's say this pixel right here is uh, pixel nine, um, you know, and that means this is pixel zero. So this is a start or like pixel one, two, three, but then pixel negative one, I want that to be pixel nine. And then pixel negative two, I want that to be pixel eight, for example. So if I just add 10 to a negative value, that's going to offset it and give me a positive value that's going to be within that range. And the nice thing is the fmod operator also works with negative values. And it, it also ensures, it, you know, I'm never going to get a value from this fmod that's, um, that's less than negative 9.99999 or greater than 9.999. So that just means that, you know, I know for sure my position at this point is never going to be more than uh, positive 9.9 .9 or negative 9.9 .9 to infinity. Uh, so I know that I can always add 10 and get a value that's going to be back into a positive value. So let's do that. So if my position, or actually I don't need parentheses in Python, uh, if my position is less than zero, then just add 10 to it. So we'll offset it by 10. Uh, and so if we go back to the Arduino code, that's exactly what I'm doing right here. So you can see I'm just calling the fmod operator and I'm offsetting it by 10 when it goes down to a negative value. Um, okay, and then the last thing is I need to make sure to return my position from this function. Okay, cool. So now I've got a way to represent my fidget spinner. So let's create an instance of the spinner class. Um, so we'll say fidget, uh, let, let's create it actually right before our loop down here. So we'll say my uh, fidget spinner, spinner, and we'll just, oops, I'm back in C++ mode here. Uh, so let's, let's say, uh, actually, oh wow, I'm, I'm way out of it here. Let's say spinner equals fidget spinner. That's the proper way to create an instance of a class. Uh, okay, so this is going to make an object called spinner that is an instance of this fidget spinner class. Uh, it's going to, oh, I forgot to set the decay value. So 
I set that as a global variable um, here that I kind of read from inside of here. But you know what, let's, let's make that a value that I can pass in. And I'll give it a default value of like 0.5, for example. Uh, so I want to keep track of that decay value. And then now, instead of using this global right here, let's just pass in, uh, oops, I need to actually tell it the self.decay value. So it's going to use the value that it remembered here. I don't necessarily have to do this. This just makes this class easier to share. Like you could have multiple fidget spinners, each with their own decay rate that's separate. So yeah, maybe you want to do that. Maybe, you know, if you have like three or four circuit playgrounds or something, or maybe multiple NeoPixel strips or something, that'd be kind of cool uh, with different speeds. Okay, so that's what I want. And then uh, let's just be explicit. And so when I create an instance of this, um, you know, I can pass in, if I don't pass in the decay parameter, it's going to assume the default value is 0.5, but let's just use this global now so that I can more easily tweak this um, in my Python code. Okay, so now I've got my spinner. Uh, let's visualize this thing. So let's light up the NeoPixels and actually show this thing as it moves. So to do that, I'm actually going to need to import the NeoPixel module. So like I mentioned before, you know, remember, like I said, uh, make sure to copy that NeoPixel.mpy uh, file onto the board. This uses the NeoPixel library that, uh, that we've shown before. Uh, I'll put a link in the description to some of the guides I've done that kind of mention the NeoPixel library. Uh, but I'll, I'll just show you, it's, real, it's pretty straightforward to use this. Uh, this is exactly the same as NeoPixel module with MicroPython. Uh, so for Circuit Playground, um, the Circuit Playground Express board, to control the NeoPixels on it, I'll show you what you need to do. You need to create an instance of the NeoPixel class and point it at the NeoPixel pin. And luckily in the board module, we make this really easy. We have an explicit pin called NeoPixel uh, that you can use. So let's uh, create uh, a NeoPixel strip for the 10 pixels Oops. on Circuit Playground Express. So we'll call this pixels. And in the NeoPixel module, there's a NeoPixel class. Uh, this needs to take in the pin that's connected to the input of the NeoPixels. And so for Circuit Playground, for the 10 NeoPixels that are built into the board, there's actually a board.neopixel uh, pin that you want to use. And so it's, it's that easy. Just pick the NeoPixel pin. And then I need to tell how many pixels on Circuit Playground Express. There are only 10 pixels, uh, unless you've hacked up the board significantly. So you probably want to use 10 right here. Uh, and then let's just turn them all off uh, to start with. So I'm going to call the fill function. This takes in a tuple with three values, uh, the RGB value to set all the pixels. So if I set it all to 0, 0, 0, that's basically going to turn them all to, to black or to off. And then there's the pixels dot, uh, I believe it's right. Um, or no, I think it's, it's either show or right. I always forget which one it is. Uh, so let's see. I'm going to save this and then let, let's run this and see if it runs or not. If it doesn't run, uh, actually, maybe just to, to make sure that if it's working or not, let's have it turn all the pixels on to a red color. So if this is working, then I should hopefully see the pixels turn red. Uh, and if I got something wrong, then it won't turn red. So I run that. Okay, obviously I got something wrong. Uh, what I like to do in that case then is run without the dash n parameter. And what this will do is it's going to run it. If it gets an error, it's going to copy the text of that error and it's going to return it to me. So I can easily kind of see what happened here. And okay. Uh, so it's telling me here, I got this attribute error. NeoPixel object has no attribute show. Ah, uh, that's because it's actually called write. Uh, so I always forget which one it is. It's, uh, in Arduino, it's called one thing. In Python, we call it another thing. So, uh, okay, let's run this thing again. I'm going to, let's try it with a dash n. Let's see if this works. So, uh, okay, so hey, everything just lit up red. So I think I got that right. Um, okay, cool. So I've got my NeoPixels. And then uh, let, let's set them back to zero instead of red. So I, I, you know, I know that they're working for now, so I don't, I don't need to see that every time I start this up. Okay, so I've got my spinner, I've got my pixels. Let's put it together, and we're pretty close to getting this thing uh, spinning here. So in my main loop, you know, I, I've got the logic already. It, it detects when there's a click, and, and we've already restricted that you know, based on um, that uh, accelerometer, this click config right here. It's only going to look at that x-axis. Uh, so now basically I just need to tell when I detect a click, let's just have my spinner start spinning. So we'll say spinner.spin and give it a velocity. So I know, let, let's make this a variable at the top. We'll say uh, spin velocity. And this is in pixels per second. So this is how fast it's going to move in pixels per second. So let's say 25.0. So that's like really fast. And it's positive. This could be negative though. You could say positive or negative values here. Uh, you know, you could play around with these. Uh, okay, so spin at the spin velocity. So that's going to start the spinner spinning. Now to actually visualize the spinner, 
I need to call that get position function, uh, and that's going to give me the new position of the spinner. So if I call spinner dot get position, but now it gets a little tricky because I need to tell it how much time elapsed since the last time this loop ran. Uh, but I can do that. I can figure that out in uh, in Python. So in the time module with Circuit Python, we have the time dot monotonic function, and that just returns a floating point value that has that's based on the number of seconds that have elapsed. It's not like the wall time. It's not going to tell me, you know, it is 725 and 35 seconds. It's just going to tell me, you know, this is second 102. And if I call the time.monotonic function a second later, it's going to tell me it's time 103. You know, it's going to keep increasing and it gives you floating point accuracy uh, down to the millisecond level, which is kind of nice. So so I need to keep track of how much time elapses between each iteration of this loop so I can tell the get position function that. Um, basically, if I keep track of uh, you know, when my loop ends, what that time was, and then if I look at the time when my loop starts, I can know what that difference is if I look at the difference there. So let's just start by calling time.monotonic at the very start of my loop. And then <clears throat> before I compute the position, now let's update the elapsed time. So let's get the current time as time.monotonic again. Now let's compute the delta. This is going to be current time minus your last time. So that's basically just going to take, OK, what was my last time around the loop? Here's my current time around the loop. Current should always be higher than last, hopefully. Uh, and then uh, that's going to give me the difference. So you know it might be a really small value, or it might be a really large value if a lot of time has elapsed in between here, but it's going to give me that difference. And then I also need to be careful to update that last value so that now the next time the loop starts, last is going to be set to the current time of the previous iteration. So that's how it's going to figure out the difference in time here. Um, OK, and so now we'll say update the spinner position. So now I've got this delta value, which is telling me the elapsed time since my last loop. So I can pass that in. Uh, the spinner function is going to return back. Here's my position. I know that this is a value that's going to be from 0 to uh, almost 10, not exactly 10. It's never going to give me exactly 10. It's going to give me like 9.999. Uh, so if I take the integer value of that, if I just truncate it, then I can map that to one of the pixels on the board. Uh, but before I do that, I probably want to turn all the pixels off because this is a new frame of animation. Just clear all the pixels. Um, so let's say, uh, let's clear the pixels and turn on the pixel at fidget spinner position. So let's call pixels.fill with that 0, 0 value. It says turns off all the pixels. And then let's set the pixel that the fidget spinner is currently pointing at. So let's in the pixels object, you just choose the index of 0 through 9. That's all 10 of the pixels on the board. And so if I just take my current position and I grab the integer value of it, because remember, that position value is floating point, so it could be like 1.5. but by grabbing the integer value, it's going to truncate it. So 1.5 is just going to, going to turn into the value 1. It's going to pick the lowest integer value uh, near that. Uh, so that's going to drop it down to value of 1. And then let's set this to a color. So let's set this to maybe the color red, like 0, uh, 255, 0, 0, 0 um, here. Or how about this? How about uh, let's just set color equals, we'll give this a variable I can tweak at the top here. So we'll set the color there, and then we'll set the color here. And OK, so let's say, oh, and then I also need to call the pixels dot, is it right or show? I've already forgotten it's right. Uh, so pixels dot right. So let's do that, because I need to actually update the pixel hardware now. You know, I've changed the colors in memory. Now I need to push that out to the NeoPixels. Um, OK, so uh, in theory, I'm going to go for broke here, and I'm going to run this uh, without checking for any errors. So let's see what happens. Um, OK, this is good. So it just started up, and this pixel turned on. That's because, remember, in my fidget spinner, it starts at position 0, and it has no initial velocity. Um, so this code is running, and it's waiting for a click, but it's also asking, you know, what is your current fidget spinner position? And right now, as far as it knows, it's still position 0. It hasn't been spun yet. It hasn't been kicked. Uh, so it's just using its default kind of initial value. Now let's see what happens if I pick it up, and if I tap it, hey, check that out. It just started spinning. Uh, and so again, you know, it detected that spin. It called the, the spinner.spin function using just the velocity I've baked into it, that 25 value, uh, and it started spinning. 
Now the thing is, you notice, you know, if I tap it from this side, it works. If I tap it from this side, you know, the other side, it, it spins, but it, it's not going in the direction that I tapped it. Uh, so again, that's because I'm only detecting that single click. Uh, it's funny, you know, I drop it on the on the ground, and you can see that it, it kind of it also gave a high enough impulse to uh, set off that axis. But again, you know, I don't know which direction it's coming from, um, but I can tell at least that you know something tapped that axis. You know, if I if I kind of click it like that, then it, it's going to spin, and I don't know which way, but I'm I'm applying the spin the the velocity to it, and you know I can change these values like if I want to slow it down. So like let's have it only go at like a five velocity, and maybe let's change the color. Let's make it like a a pinkish color. How about uh, red and blue at full intensity? Let's save that, and then let's run our example now. So now I've got kind of the pink pixel, and so now it's going to run really slowly. If I tap it, see. You know, just kind of nudges. This is like the the fidget spinner that you hope you don't have. That it's you know it's so clogged up, it's spinning that slowly. But I can make a super fast fidget spinner if I want. You know, hey, I guess that's the big game is to see you know how well you can lubricate the bearing and how fast you can get it to spin. You know, I'm amazed that people aren't using like super advanced uh, materials. You know, I'm sure NASA has some crazy bearings that can spin. You know, like has anyone done a super conducting fidget spinner that like levitates itself? For zero friction, uh, if if no one's done that yet, somebody needs to get on that. Uh, but I can make it virtually because hey, I'm just simulating this fidget spinner. So let's make this thing move at 100 pixels per second. Let's see what happens uh, with that. So I'm going to run this, and then uh, I'm going to tap it. And so now you can see, whoa, it's like a light show. But you can see it as it slows down. It, it you know you can you can see it start to to follow that kind of natural progression. You can see like it, it goes wild because it's moving so fast that it's just, you know, you're just seeing it kind of blinking around in all those various positions. So you know, if I spin it like that, you get that fun light show and then it slows down like that. So so that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so like I mentioned before, um, you know, I kind of hinted at, can we do better? Can we do something like detect? Because, you know, again, the Arduino version, it knows which version uh, or which, which side I'm hitting it from, you know, that side or that side, and also knows the magnitude, the velocity of it. Now, like I mentioned before, if you go back to the app notes, um, you know, in click source register, it gives you the sign. So I can tell, um, you know, was this a positive or negative direction that, uh, that the click detection was was found on. Um, so that's kind of cool. Now, if you go to the, the the code for this, you know, I'm calling this read click function. It's only giving me back a boolean. It's just telling me true or false, was there a click or not? And that's because the implementation in the library right now doesn't look at that sign bit. Um, it just ignores it and it just assumes you're looking for like a tap or something like that. Um, so, but luckily in the library, I exposed there's a read click underscore raw function and that gives you the raw value of this click source register. Um, so I can actually get this raw value and just look myself and see you know, is this sign bit positive or negative? And it's actually kind of interesting. If it's zero, then it's positive, and if it's one, it's negative. Uh, so I, I don't know. You, you ever thought like one would mean positive? But I don't know. Uh, every chip is different. So let's let's change our code. So let's get the let's get the value here. We'll say click source equals this read click raw. Uh, and so now I don't have a simple boolean. I need to actually check like what are the bit values inside of here. Uh, and but I can do that really easily in Python. So let's see if um, if click source equals. Uh, oops, I don't need a double equals. Uh, or I actually I do. If this equals the value, uh, the the bit value, that zero b notation. So I'm going to specify every bit that I care about. So if I go back to the data sheet, uh, there's basically this i a value. This is interrupt active. Uh, and just the way that this chip works, when it detects that click detection, this IA value is set to a, a positive, a one uh, bit. There's also this single click bit, that should be set also. Uh, and then the sign bit I wanna look at. Uh, and then also the X or the, you know, which, which axes I care about. Um, so, okay, so let's construct a value that has, and the initial value here, you can see there's actually one bit, the, the highest order bit is not used at all here. So that's gonna be zero, so I should expect a value zero. Then I expect a value of one because that's gonna be my interrupt active. Uh, then I expect D click, the double click bit to be zero. So let's say that's zero. Then it's uh, the single click bit, that, that one I expect to be set because I, I expect this to be a single click event that I saw. So we'll set that to a one. 
Uh, and then the next value is the sine bit. So for this, it could be either zero or one. And so I'm gonna look at both options. So in this case, if it's zero, this is gonna be a positive click. Um, in, in that direction. And then I have the three axes as the different bits. And so the Z and the Y axis aren't turned on, so I should always see zero for that. So let's say zero, zero, and then one. This should finally be the, the X axis at the end. And just to make sure, I should have eight values here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep, eight values there. Um, okay, so these are the, the bits that I expect to be in that click source register for a positive spin. Um, so let's say this, and maybe we'll get rid of our, our print statement. And then let's just do an else if uh, click source equals, and let's take this exact value again, but now let's set this bit right here, that's the sign bit, let's set this to one, because back in the data sheet, it's gonna set sign to one if it's a negative direction of the spin this way. So let's set that. And then in that case, let's just set it to negative spin velocity. So this will go in the opposite direction. And maybe let's set this to a value of like how about 66 uh, for the velocity. OK, so in theory, our fidget spinner now should be able to detect the direction. So let's run this thing. And if I didn't mess anything up, yep, that looks OK. So now let's see what happens if I tap it from this side. OK, that's good. It's spinning in that direction. And then if I tap it from the other side, so if I tap it like that way, hey, check that out, it's spinning in that direction. So that's pretty cool. You know, just by looking at that sign bit, I'm able to detect which direction did you actually click this thing from. So that's pretty slick. Um, you know, it's kind of neat. It's, again, it's just a good example of look at your hardware, like read the data sheet, you know, see what capabilities are built into it because there might be more than uh, what like some of the libraries expose. Um, you know, you might find interesting ways to use them. Okay, so for the last thing then is, can I actually detect what was the magnitude of the click? You know, how strong was it? Was it like a, a light tap? You know, again, with the Arduino version, a very light tap, um, maybe more than a light tap, I guess in that case, you know, a, a light tap kind of spins it uh, slowly. So like, let's see, if I go this way, maybe a very light tap. That's kind of light, I guess. And then if a you know stronger tap, you can see it starts spinning really fast. So can I figure out what is the magnitude of that click? And unfortunately, the click detection doesn't have like a register to store like what was the height of that impulse. You know, if you go back to if you read the application note, like it's really cool how the click detection works, but it doesn't tell you how big was this value above the threshold. But if you read the rest of this app note, there's another feature of this chip. Uh, and it's actually this thing, it's called a FIFO buffer, a first in, first out buffer. And what this is, is basically the chip can actually remember what were the 32 last accelerometer readings that it saw. So it, it can just internally keep track of what's the history of the acceleration values. Now, this chip samples acceleration at a really fast rate, at least the way it's configured, it samples acceleration uh, 400 times a second, which is good because it can see fast impulses. Uh, so you won't get like a really long history. I can't tell like five minutes ago what was the acceleration, but I should be able to tell, you know, once I detect a click, uh, and that, that window of time has elapsed, if this FIFO buffer is enabled, that's gonna store inside of it what is the, you know, what were the 32 last accelerometer readings. So if I look at that FIFO buffer and just see like what was the biggest value within the last 32 uh, readings, I should probably have, you know, that maximum acceleration value that, that had passed. Or if it's a minimum value, if it was like a negative value, you know, I could look through and see what was the smallest value inside of that FIFO buffer. So that's what I did actually, is I went through, read a little bit more in the data sheet, uh, and you can see in this app note that talks all about the FIFO buffer, it's really advanced, it has all these modes. Um, you can put it into a mode where it will fill up this buffer and then wait for you to read all the values out before filling it up again. That might be handy if you're like doing a lot of things on your microcontroller, and then you wanna periodically pull in some accelerometer values. Um, or it can be in this mode that's called stream mode, where in stream mode, it's just constantly grabbing the, the latest acceleration value, throwing it into the FIFO buffer, and then it's just, it's throwing it into the oldest position. So just over time, that, that FIFO buffer is gonna always have the 32 most recent values. And just, you know, no matter what's happening, the accelerometer is just throwing in the latest readings into the oldest position. So, so the way it works then is when you read accelerometer values from it, it actually gives you 
the value that happened 32 kind of moments in time ago. Uh, so you don't get the latest value of the accelerometer, you get kind of the oldest value. But if you do 32 reads of the accelerometer, it will give you, you know, here is your, your, your FIFO buffer, or all, all 32 of those values inside of there. Uh, so that's actually what I did. And I, I actually made this as an example inside of uh, the LIS3DH library. So if you go into the examples, there's this spinner.py. So I'm not going to go through modifying all of the code right now um, to show how to do this because I don't want the stream to go for too much longer. Um, but that's what I've done in this example. So in this example, I'm doing the exact same thing as we just saw where I'm looking at, um, well, first of all, I'm setting that click config register and I'm setting it to the specific value so that it only detects clicks on the, the X axis, which is, you know, the axis that, that you, that I want to click on my, uh, on, on the board. Uh, and then it's also just looking at that click source register. So it's using that read click raw and it's just looking for, you know, is it a value that is uh, positive or negative? So like we just saw before, I can detect which direction that it happened from, but I do some extra magic here. So I'm actually calling this write register uh, byte function here to set some registers myself to a custom value. And this is actually using an internal function of the LIS3DH library. So ideally I should probably go back to the LIS3DH library and add some functions that say, hey, enable the FIFO buffer and turn it on, you know, in stream mode, for example. Uh, but I didn't do that yet, but I'm just kind of showing this is kind of the power of Python. Uh, you know, these are still functions. I can still call them. So if, if I look at the code for this LIS3DH library, um, I can see what it does and I can call its internal functions. Now you probably don't want to do this in practice all the time because, you know, as a library author, uh, my assumption is I can do whatever I want with these internal functions. If I want to change the parameters they take, if I want to change how they work, if I want to delete them completely, I'm free to do that with the assumption that no one is going to depend on that, that code in their own, uh, in their own code. Um, so I'm kind of breaking that assumption here. So, you know, this, this is just something to be aware of. Like you can do this, um, but just, you know, know when you're doing it, that you really need to look at how the library works. And like I said, in the future, we'll probably extend this library to add some more functionality, but basically I just set a couple registers myself. So again, go back to the app note. You can read about the FIFO mode. It has these four different modes and they're all pretty complex and advanced. I put it into the stream mode that just keeps a circular buffer of the 32 last readings for this. And so in order to do this, I first have to set this control five register and you have to turn this one special bit on that says, okay, enable the FIFO. Um, and then this uh, OX2E register, this is the FIFO control register. And this is where I tell it to go into the stream mode by setting these bits right here for it. Um, and then I, like I mentioned in the comment right here, um, you have to make this call after you call the set click function because inside the set click function, it actually modifies this control five register. It has to set this bit right here at the top. So if I set this, uh, if I, if I flip on the bit for FIFO mode before calling set click, set click is actually going to obliterate it. It's not going to, uh, enable the FIFO. So again, that's like a weird dependency, you know, because I'm, I didn't build this into the library because I'm hacking around with the registers myself. I kind of need to know what this library is doing. So, you know, again, just be aware of this code, like it depends on being called in exactly this order. And that's just because we're getting down to the very low level. You know, we're reading the data sheet, we're looking at the registers and we're tweaking those bits and things the way we want. Uh, so you, you're kind of on your own at that point in, in some way. So, you know, know, you need to know, know what you're doing a little bit when you're, when you're dealing with the registers. Uh, and then otherwise, the main loop has not changed much at all. So the only thing that's changed is after I detect a click and I've just changed how I do that detection. Like first I look and see if uh, that very first bit in the click source register is set. And if I go back here uh, to that click source register, uh, I can actually see uh, way back up here. Yep, here's a bunch of registers. So this IA red bit, when that thing's set, uh, then it just means that a click was detected. So I don't care which direction that click was detected from yet. I just care about, okay, uh, we detected a click. Um, actually, here, let me go back to the, the code for that. So once I detect a click, then I actually go through and I want to find what was the highest value inside of those last 32 readings that are in that FIFO buffer. And so the way that you read the FIFO buffer is you actually can just read the acceleration values 
Um, and then in this case, I only care about the x-axis, so I'm going to grab, because this acceleration property returns a tuple of three values, the x, y, z acceleration values. If I call this LIS3DH acceleration property 32 times, it's going to give me those 32 previous readings. Now, there's one caveat I should mention here is that, um, you know, you need to read that very quickly because the accelerometer is still in that stream mode where it's just, you know, every 400 times a second, you know, every 400th of a second, it's grabbing a new reading and throwing it into the buffer and it's chucking out the oldest value. So once I start reading these values, you know, ideally I need to read them all really fast, like within a 400th of a second um, or else I'll lose like the oldest reading, like, you know, that reading is good, like the newest reading is going to come in and, and take that place of it. So, and in reality, you know, I haven't measured it, but I have a feeling that the Python code is probably not fast enough to read all of these values at once. So I might be losing some of those values. Um, but in practice, it doesn't seem to matter. It seems like, a, you know, I, it, it's, it's happening fast enough to get a, a decent approximation of, you know, what, what was a, a large acceleration that we recently saw. Uh, but what I do is I just grab the first acceleration value, make that, I, I read the first value, so that's, you know, value zero, and there's 31 values after that to read, because there are 32 total. Um, and then I just loop through 31 times, um, you know, call that acceleration property to read the, the next value from the FIFO. I'm only grabbing the x-axis from it. I don't care about the other axes. I'm taking the absolute value because, you know, again, this might be positive or negative, and I, I don't really care about that positive or negative yet. I just need to know what was the highest value. So if it's negative, you know, use absolute value to turn that into a positive value. And just look in my loop. I'm just keeping track of, um, you know, what was the highest value that I previously saw. And if the new value that I got was higher than that value, set my maximum value to that uh, new value that I read inside of here. So that after this little loop runs, I've, I've just swept through the FIFO, hopefully, uh, and looked at all 32 of those values and found what was that highest value inside of there. And then now I can see if it was a positive or a negative click, I'll just set my spin to that uh, value that was that was specified here. So that value is going to be uh, an acceleration value in meters per second squared. So, you know, usually I'll get a value that's like 10 or 20 or something like that if it's a really strong click. So I don't really need to like scale this, but I could if I wanted like, if, if I was getting like really fast values, I could divide this by something if I wanted, for example. Uh, but then the rest of this is really the same. Like this sketch I've made a little fancier in that um, you can set the colors up here. Like I have a primary and a secondary color. Um, but again, it's all, it's the, it's just like we looked at before. Uh, as far as, you know, I get the new position uh, and then I just, you know, set the, the pixel. In this case, actually for this, this spinner example, I turn on two pixels. So I turn on the pixel at the current position but then I turn on the exact opposite pixel. So again, like this Arduino version, um, you know, I have two pixels turned on, so it just makes it easier to kind of see the spin. Uh, and so it's, it's easy to do that. You know, I just know that position, uh, after I've taken the integer value of it, I know it's gonna be a value from zero to nine inclusive. And so if I add five to it, then that's gonna give me, you know, a pixel that's five pixels past it. And because there are 10 pixels on this board, that means it's gonna be exactly opposite it. But I need to be careful to, to do the uh, that modulus operator again because, you know, if my position is pixel 7, let's say, and then I add 5 to it, now I have position 12, but there are 12 pixels on this board, so I need to apply the modulus operator, modulo 10, that's going to wrap me back around to position 2 in that case, um, or uh, position 1 actually, I believe. So anyways, that's what's happening here. So I'm turning on two pixels in this case um, and then just writing them out. So let's just run this example. Uh, I've already got it downloaded here. So let's run the spinner.py. And this one is all set up to use Circuit Playground. Um, it assumes that you've got um, you know, the, the board NeoPixel and there are 10 of them. Um, so again, there's nothing like fancy, like this, this is made to work on Circuit Playground Express basically. Um, but if I run this thing, so now it starts off, and this is cool. It it have, it starts off with a green pixel, uh, but it starts off with the pixels, uh, with the two pixels. And then if I tap it from this side, then hey, notice it started spinning in that side. And if I tap it from this side, then uh, you can see I tapped it a little bit stronger and it, it started spinning a little bit faster. And if I very lightly tap it, let's see if, if I can kind of get a, a slow spin on it. So oh, that wasn't strong enough. So let's see if that was maybe a little bit lighter tap. Okay, let's see if I, if I really flick it, if I can get it to kind of get a strong impulse here. So 
Oh yeah, there we go. I think that did it. So you can see it kind of stopped there for a second. That's because it was spinning so fast uh, that basically, you know, it wasn't, it's not updating the pixels fast enough. And so you kind of get this alias scene uh, for that, but that was a pretty strong flick. So if I click that thing again, then you can kind of see that, you know, okay, it spins around. I mean, interesting, it, it actually spun in the opposite direction there. And that, that might be because, you know, this, the accelerometer sometimes, uh, you know, it's, if it's not sampling fast enough, it might miss that initial spike and the board kind of shakes back and forth a little bit. And so maybe detected that the, the shake in the opposite direction there. So, you know, but I can tap it in that way and see that it goes that way. Uh, and then if I've noticed that if you tap it, if you flick it, sometimes you do get that kind of that false positive or, or it spins in the opposite direction. Whereas if you tap it like that, then usually there's less chance that it, that it kind of goes in the opposite direction like that. So cool. So that's it. I think that's what I wanted to show here was, you know, I've made a pretty good facsimile of the Arduino version of the fidget spinner. You know, the spinner, it detects uh, which direction, like which side I've tapped the board from. And it also de detects the magnitude, um, you know, and in the Arduino version, I did this just by sampling the raw accelerometer value and applying all the logic myself. So I do this smoothing, I do this peak detection, I figure out the magnitude of the peak. Um, so it's, you know, that's one way to do it. It's not like the right or the wrong way. It's, it's one way to do it. And then I kind of showed with CircuitPython, uh, there's another way I can do it using features that are built into the LIS3DH. So it has a concept of click detection, which is really just an impulse detection algorithm. And I can configure that click detection to look at one of the axes that I care about, like the X axis. Uh, and then, so that'll tell me, you know, when it detects an impulse and I don't need my code to do that. It's just the, the chip itself is doing that. My code then just asks the chip, did you detect a click or not? Uh, and then it can actually also tell me what was the direction that it saw that click from. Was it a positive or negative uh, click? So now I can know which direction I want to spin my spinner. And then I showed with the FIFO mode, that extra mode that's built into the LIS3DH, it can keep a history of what were the last accelerometer values that it saw. So that if I turn on that FIFO mode, when I detect a click, I can go back and look at those old values and try to see, okay, what was the biggest value? Like what was that impulse that I saw? to kind of know, was this a strong click or a weak click, and then spin my spinner based on that click so that I get a cool little thing like this that, uh, that basically, you know, if I tap it from this side, then it's gonna have a, a slow, uh, you know, a little bit of a movement. If I tap it more strongly from, uh, from this side, then it moves, you know, very fast like that way. So really cool, fun little project. Uh, you know, again, this is the digital fidget spinner, the only fidget spinner with no moving parts. Uh, you know, there's no bearing that will go bad on this one. This, this can win any fidget spinner competition because I can set the velocity to whatever value I want. Uh, so this is the, the world's, this could be the world's fastest fidget spinner. Also, I can move it a thousand pixels per second if I want. Uh, so again, it's, it's all code. It's all stuff you can change and, and make it the, the coolest fidget spinner uh, around. So, uh, okay. So if there are any questions, maybe throw them into the chat and, uh, I will see if I can answer them real fast. Uh, yeah, folks are saying this is uh, one of the fidget spinners that they approve of. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. The fidget spinner is, is a weird thing. So I'm old enough to remember uh, a lot of these fads. I remember the snap bracelets, which I guess I think they've sort of come back into into uh, favor again or something. So, yeah. I, I just I know you know ten years from now we're gonna come back and and remember. Hey, you know what was that that fidget spinner fad? So you know, hang on to those things. Or the the fidget spinners also kind of remind me of pogs which were another fad from when I was in school. Uh, that was basically this like game you would play, you'd stack up these little milk caps or whatever, and then you'd like have a slammer that you throw against them. So kind of reminds me of that, uh, the, the fun of that. So I don't know, yeah, so I think the older uh, folks around us that maybe don't really care as much about this fidget spinner thing. Well, my cat really wants my attention right now. She's, uh, what do you want? Hey, she's, uh, she's very interested in fidget spinners, obviously. So, uh, okay, so. I think that's it. I don't think there are any questions, so I'll wrap up the stream. Uh, let's see, we'll jump back to the main view right here. Let's turn that off. Uh, oops, I, there we go. So again, yeah, so thanks a lot for watching. Uh, this is Tony from Adafruit. This was the Digital Fidget Spinner Part 2, where I showed how to convert this Arduino-based fidget spinner into a CircuitPython-based fidget spinner. So this is Python code that's running this fidget spinner that's able to detect when you tap this board 
and which side you've tapped it from, which direction you've tapped it. And you can see it does this cool kind of spinning animation, um, you know, based on the, the uh, magnitude of the tap that you made. And so it's all just Python code that's running this on the Circuit Playground Express board. Uh, if you enjoyed this, definitely check out youtube.com slash Adafruit. That's where this video and all kinds of other fun project videos are. Uh, we have tons of content, like pretty much every day. There's some new video coming out, so check that out. Uh, check out twitch.tv slash Adafruit. That's where I like to stream these things live. Uh, usually every Friday I'll do a live stream. So I've been focusing a lot on Python and CircuitPython. So I'm sure you'll see a lot more Python content in the future. And the Circuit Playground Express board in particular, this is kind of the, the fun new thing that we're playing with. So I have some ideas for some fun uh, other projects to try out with this. In fact, I want to see if I can read the speed of a real fidget spinner using Circuit Playground Express. Oh boy, what is the cat doing now? She oh, There's a power supply over there with a, a tasty cable that I think she's gonna probably knock off the table. So we'll see what happens. Anyway, so I have an idea um, because Circuit Playground Express, like I mentioned, has this infrared receiver and LED. And so I might be able to use those to detect the speed of an object that's spinning in front of the board. So I don't know, maybe tune in next week. We might have some more uh, things like that to, to check out. So anyways, uh, if you like this content, click the like, the subscribe, the comment button. Let us know that this is useful info and we'll keep doing streams and videos like this. Uh, until next time, this is Tony from Adafruit. So thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you later. Bye.